I can find them. Here they are. <laughs> there we go. So hopefully I didn't overpromise on the title. Why was God so hidden? <clears throat> but, but part of what I want to talk about tonight and what I want to explore a little bit is maybe not necessarily a question of any one specific insight into the story, any one passage in the story of the Megillah, but really a broader look at some of the themes, some of the themes that are drawn out through textual parallels, through thematic parallels, but some of the themes that develop in the characters of the Megillah or that are really characterized in the Megillah, and to think about how that situates the context of the Megillah so that when we hear it together in Shul, Thursday night and Friday, or when we learn it on our own, we'll have a little bit more of a contextual grasp of what's going on. So to that end, I guess let's start. So personally, my favorite parts of the Megillah are always the parts where we lay in the Eicha truck. Those are also always the parts that I'm super excited to lay in. So sadly, I mean, good for you guys. Sadly for me, I won't be laying for Stanton this year. I'm a little tone deaf. But the Eicha truck is always my favorite because it stands out. It's just like really beautiful and distinctive. And thankfully tonight, we're going to be viewing a lot of the Pesukim that we view in Eicha truck. So one of those, one of the special Pesukim that we're going to see in source one, we have the introduction of our heroes, the protagonists of the story, Mordechai and Esther. So if we're going to understand our story and we're going to understand the context, we know the first chapter, and we'll get to the first chapter, gives us broad stage setting. It tells us that we're the king, the time period, the country, the nationality, the setting, etc. And then the second chapter gives us our protagonists. So we're going a little out of order. We'll start with our protagonists in the second chapter. So we meet Mordechai and Esther. And there we see interesting characterizations of them. Ish Yehudi Hayab Shushan Habira. There was a Judean or Jewish man. Now, again, just to point out, the term Ish Yehudi is actually pretty loaded. Perhaps nowadays we're used to the idea of Yehudim and the idea that the Jew, a Jude means a Jew. But biblically, it's not so clear that Yehudi meant anything other than somebody from the tribe of Judah. So it's already interesting that we have Ish Yehudi here being used to refer to a Jew. So we have an Ish Yehudi, Hayab Shushan Habira, is in the capital Shushan. Okay, interesting that we're being situated as the capital, and perhaps that relates to the political context that'll play out later. Ushmo Mordechai ben Yair ben Shimi ben Kish Gishimini. And his name is Mordechai, and we're given a long lineage. And we, if those who are interested, the Shabbat for the sermon, I think I'll talk a little bit about Mordechai's lineage. So look out for that email or show up in person. But we see we have Mordechai situated from this, in a specific family. He's our hero. He's introduced. And now we switch to the Echa trap, of course, one of my favorites. Asher Hoglam Yerushalayim, who is exiled from Jerusalem, Im Hagola Asher Hagaltam Yechonia Melch Yehuda, with the exile that was exiled by Yechonia, the king of Judah, Asher Hagla Nebuchadnezzar Melch Babel, with the exile of Nebuchadnezzar Melch Babel. And really, this is our first time in the story where we have the story situated in Jewish context, in Jewish history. Until now, we were just in Persian context. We knew the Persian king, Achashverosh, but we didn't know anything about what we're up to in the Jewish story. But in the, in the context of introducing our protagonists, our Jewish heroes, we now understand where in history are we? We're after the exile. We're after the first exile, after Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, ba of Babel, of Babylon came and exiled the Jews. And that's introduced through this lineage of Mordechai, uh, the, who, who is this uh, ex-Jerusalemite who experienced this exile. But he omen at Hadassah, very interesting verb. And he is the omen, the uh, caretaker, I guess, of Hadassah. He, Esther, she is Esther. So this is very interesting. Again, we have two names given to this woman. Hadassah, Esther. Yeah. Something we'll see very shortly. There's some interesting name playing going on here. Bat Dodo, his niece, so the daughter of his, uh, of his, I guess his uncle, his cousin, he ain't la aveim, because she had no father or mother. So he adopts her, he takes care of her. And she was beautiful, and when her parents died, Mordechai took her as a daughter. So what we see so far is an introduction to our two characters, Mordechai and Esther, and we see historical context. We're dealing in the period specifically following the exile, following the first Babylonian exile of Nebuchadnezzar. So far, so good. But when you look at the names, Mordechai and Esther, when you look at our characters and who they are, they're actually a little bit strange. And it stands out a little bit that these characters are a little bit strange. Because as we pointed out, Esther here has a couple of names. 
right? Hadassah and Esther. Mordechai is a name I don't think we've seen any Jewish character have so far. And perhaps because of the uniqueness of these names, and perhaps because of part of the desire to make all of Tanakh feel even more coherent and more predictive, Chazal and the Gemara ask an interesting question. Esther min HaTorah minayin. Where do we have a hint in the Torah to the name and or the character Esther? So on the one hand, this is sort of a strange idea. It seems retrojective. What do you mean? The five books of Moshe, the Torah is going to have some sort of predictive sense of Esther, something about Esther. But I think more broadly, we can understand what exactly Chazal are trying to do. Chazal are pointing out that the name Esther is strange. We haven't seen that name before. Plus, it's a second name. We say her name's Hadassah. Yeah. And, a nice a nice name. Name. and Hadassah, he Esther. She has a second name now. All of a sudden, she's Esther. It's a strange occurrence. So Chazal are trying to figure out what's the significance of these strange names. So given that question, they look to the Torah. Where do we see roots for these words, for these names in the Torah? So what do they come up with? For Esther, they say, the Anochi Hester Esther. And they quote a Pasuk, which we'll see inside a little bit later from, De from Devarim, from Deuteronomy, where God says, I will hide my face on that day. There it says, we see very clearly the word Astir, I will hide. Take away the U, you have the name Esther. So we have a nice phonetic, and we have a nice parallel here for Esther. Very good. And we'll explore that a little bit later. Next, the Gemara goes and asks the same question, same fundamental question for Mordechai. So Mordechai, Minotaur, where do we know? Sorry, one second. Just going to mute everybody. Mute all. Okay. And then if anybody wants to either ask a question or participate, anyway, please feel free to unmute yourself and just speak up. But just in the meantime, so there's no background feedback, et cetera, I'm going to mute everyone, but don't feel that it's in any way a limitation on your ability to speak up. Please speak up. But great. So then the Gemara continues and we say, Mordechai in the Torah, where do we see the source of Mordechai in the Torah? Again, hopefully, probably not a retrojective, a historical question. Much more likely, where do we see some sort of source for the strange name, the strange focus on an unusual name? And here the Gemara quotes an unusual pasuk. Mar dror, metagaminan miradachia. It quotes a pasuk that comes up in Shemot, in Exodus, where it says flowering myrrh and describing the spices in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. And we translate that as mira dakya, as this Aramaic form, this Aramaic form of these myrrh, of the spices, sounds like Mordechai. So two very strange statements by Chazal. We're introduced to Esther and Mordechai, Chazal identify Esther with the Pasuk in Dvarim, and Mordechai with this idea of the myrrh incense in the temple. But I want to go and point out that it's not just Chazal who are doing this strange, retrojective look at Mordechai, comparing him to the temple, comparing him to early Pesukim, but actually, I think part of, not even think, it's clear part of what the Megillah is doing, and many people point out part of what the Megillah is doing, is drawing these parallels itself. The Megillah itself is intentionally trying to situate Mordechai in a description and in a context that's familiar to us already, that already has connotations in the Bible, that already means something in Tanakh. So for example, and we see that Mordechai is described as the Ish Yehudi. A Jewish man appeared by Shushan Habira, the capital of Shushan. And as I pointed out, Ish Yehudi, while well, now we might be used to the idea of Yehudim meaning Jews, of Jude meaning Jews in some languages, in biblical context, a Yehudi was someone from Judah, the tribe of Judah. It's a little bit unusual even that we're referring to somebody who wasn't from the tribe of Judah as an Ish Yehudi, as a Jew. But this, in, this unusual use of the term Ish Yehudi does have a very specific biblical context and very specific biblical usage. So, for example, if we look in source six here, sorry, just skip ahead a little for time. We see in source six that we have a prophecy of Zechariah, the last of the prophets, arguably the last of the prophets before we enter into the stage, the time period that would be governed by Esther and Mordechai, etc. But the last of the prophets, Zechariah. And Zechariah, one of his last prophecies, will start in the English. He says, thus said the Lord, people and the inhabitants of many cities shall yet come, the inhabitants of one shall go to the other and say, let us go and treat the favor of the Lord. Let us seek the Lord of hosts that will go to. So we're dealing with an eschatological vision. This is the end of days and everyone's going to be seeking God. All the people in the world will seek God. And that now takes us to verse 22. The many peoples and multitudes of the nations 
shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. So everyone's going to come to Jerusalem to worship God. Now Pasach of Gimel will transfer over to the Hebrew to be uh, precise in our language. Ko Amar Hashem thus says the God, the Lord of hosts, Be'amimahema, in those days, when everyone's coming to Jerusalem to worship God, Asher yachziku asara anashim, mekol l'shenot goyim, will take 10, people, 10 men from every language of the, every nation, v'achziku b'knath ish Yehudi, and will take hold of every Jew by their corner, le'mor ne'lcha imachem, and will pair them and say, go with them, Kishamanu elohim imachem, for we heard God is with you. In other words, in Zechariah, there's a prophetic vision that towards the end of days, every single nation of the world will be paired with an Ish Yehudi who will be their in emissary, their go-to person, who will ensure they can transition to a messianic eschatological end day where they worship God in Jerusalem in the temple. Now, I want to point out, we have Mordechai being described as this Ish Yehudi, and we have Mordechai, we know in the rabbinic literature, being described as this worldly man who spoke 70 languages in the Sanhedrin. And of course, we know in Pshat, we have Mordechai, the advisor of the non-Jewish king of Achashverosh, who saves Achashverosh's life, who comes and says they're plotting against you. So on the one hand, we have this spiritual eschatological image of an Ish Yehudi, of a spiritual savior, who's going to come at the end of days and spiritually save the other nations, bring them to Jerusalem and bring them to God's temple. But on the other hand, we have Mordechai being described as an Ish Yehudi, and he is a physical savior for these non-Jewish political figures, like Achashverosh, whose life he saves. So we have this interesting reversal flipping on its head of what we might expect with this Mordechai figure. And just to go back a little to some of the sources I skimmed over, we see this too, even with the name Mordechai, that the name Mordechai is a little bit of a reversal of expectations. Because as perhaps many, some of us might know, what is the historic root of Mordechai? Where does the name Mordechai come from? Anyone, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. My Duke. Marduk. Marduk, a Persian, the name of a Persian god. And we see not only is this clearly historically correct, we see then Tanakh, Tanakh itself is clearly, clearly sensitive to it. Because for example, when we look at some of the names of some of these Persian kings that ruled over the Jewish people, we see in source three, for example, that name, the name of one of these kings was Evil Merodak, evil Merduk. So maybe the evil thing is a particularly late retrojection of how to pronounce that. But um, evil Murduk, because it's based in this Persian root, Murduk, Marduk, and the king is drawing some sort of divine claim. Similarly, we see also elsewhere that we have Merodak Baladan is the name of another Persian king that gets mentioned elsewhere in Yeshayahu. Because even the, the, the author of these books of Nach, of these books of, of these later books in the Bible, they themselves also clearly, they're living in the Persian kingdom. They're aware that Mardok is the name of a Persian king, a Persian god. So we have this unexpected reversal here with Mordechai. On the one hand, he has this very pagan name, very strange. We also pointed out he's described as this Ish Yehudi. He's described as this person who later plays a spiritual eschatological role, or really previously in the visions of Zechariah, as prophesied as later in the end of days, playing the spiritual salvation role for foreign nations. That's the Ish Yehudi, the, uh, the, em the ambassador to the foreign nations. Here, Mordechai is an ambassador to a foreign nation, but in a political role, in a political story that is really surprisingly not spiritual in its language and in its setting for a book of Tanakh. So we have that unexpected reversal. But I want to point out just one more unexpected reversal, because we see and we pointed out that Mordechai is being situated, he's described specifically as being in Shushan, Habira, the capital. But the only other time we have mention of the word Habira in Tanakh is also a very specific reference to Habira, the capital of the Jewish nation, Jerusalem. So just for a couple of examples here, we see in Chronicles, in Divrei Yamim, Biyomer David HaMelech Lo Chol HaKahal, David said to the whole nation, Shlomo Vini, Solomon, my, my son, God's chosen you, and the work is great, because the capital, Jerusalem, is not for man, it is for God. That the first time we see this habira being used in Tanakh, much less in this Jewish context, is David telling Shlomo, 
you have to build the Bira. You have to build Jerusalem, build the temple, build the king's palace, build the king of the, the city of David, Ir David. You have to build Jerusalem. That's the Bira in Tanakh. And we see this again, for example, elsewhere in Devar Yamim, Shlomo v'nitein levav shalem, David said to Shlomo, livnot ha-bira asher hachinoti, to build the capital, which I, David, have established. So now we have this idea of Habira, the capital, which is supposed to be in Jerusalem, and not just Jerusalem, but we see Jerusalem in the context of building the temple, in the context of Shlomo's mandate to build the temple, and instead of Habira describing Yerushalayim Habira, Hamikdash Habira, we have Shushan Habira, this surprising reversal, that there is an Ishudi, there's a Jewish guy, but instead of being in Jerusalem during the end of days, during the eschatological times in Yerushalayim Habira, he's in Shushan Habira. He's in this non-Jewish land of Shushan where the Jews are super, super invested, going to parties of the king, holding political office, saving the lives of the king, treating it as if it's their own country, as if it's their own Bira. We have this unexpected reversal that instead of a focus being on Jerusalem, we have a focus on Shushan, on this different Bira, this non-Jewish focal point. And I think perhaps this will also explain the unusual pasuk, the unusual verse that the Gemara, that the rabbis bring to tie to the name Mordechai. The rabbis tie Mordechai to this verse in Shemot here in source five, this unusual verse about the incense. Take these spices, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to go into it. But they ties it to the incense. And I think the reason why is not anything specific per se about the incense, because Mar Dror and Mar Dakra, that was Chazal's best in, their best uh, mnemonic to tie Mordechai to the temple. Because part of what we're trying to do here is to show that the parallels and the themes that are being tied here are specifically to the temple, to Jerusalem, and not just Jerusalem in a political sense, but Jerusalem in the spiritual sense. Jerusalem, the spiritual capital of the Jews, where the temple sits, where the eschatological end of days will take place. That's what we're tying Mordechai to, and we're seeing an exact reversal of it. Mordechai, the wise Jew, the Ishihudi, the person who stands for the tradition, is living in Shushan, is living in exile, is living out here saving this king, involved in the politics of the time, Bashar HaMelech and the gates of the king, a total reversal of what we would expect these biblical terms to refer to. But I think this reversal, this turning on its head from the central focus of eschatological spiritual Jerusalem to political material Shushan is even furthered in this first parak, in the first chapter of Esther, where we're introduced to the general setting. So you see, in source number nine, we have the opening of Megillah, hopefully the most famous part of Megillah because everyone's still paying attention. So we see in Esther one, so we meet Achashverosh, and we hear that Achashverosh throws this huge party. Great. So we hear about the party, Bishnat Shlosh Lamacho, at the third in source in uh, verse three, in the third year of his kingship. Asa Mishdeh, he throws a party, the Chol Sarav Avada for all of his servants, Chel Prasim Adai, the entire area of Partumim and Sarim Adinot, Litha Nav the nobles and governors and provinces. Great. And now we have a description of what the party Akashvirosh throws is like. Baharoto Doshak Vod Mahuto, and showing the wealth of his kingdom, the Etz Yakar Tiferet Kudulato, and the Yakar Tiferet Kudulato, the uh, the splendor and majesty of his kingdom. And of course, a close reader of Tanakh knows that the words Yakar and Tiferet until now have only been used to refer to God, that God and the temple and God's kingdom are Yakar and are Tiferet. But now we see them being referred to Achashverosh's kingdom. Fascinating. So we hear now he has a, a huge party for six months. Then after a six month party, he has a seven day party, kicks it off with seven more days of party. Fine. And then we hear about how beautiful and extravagant this party is. It had cotton and chilet and argaman, purple wool and blue wool. Now, of course, again, where else do we see these beautiful illustrations of chilet, argaman, all these beautiful dyes and colors and wools? 
In the Mishkan. Mishkan. Exactly, in the Mishkan, about a week ago in the Parsha we read. We're very clearly drawing on the language and the connotations of the Mikdash, of the temple area. These are the aesthetics of a temple, not of a secular king. But we see them being imposed here, being used here to describe what's going on, an unexpected reversal, that the holy spiritual capital of Jerusalem is again being flipped on its head to be translated into a physical, materialist, hedonist aesthetic in Ahasuerus' kingdom. And of course, this continues, they drank out of gold vessels, and all different types of vessels. And first of all, my personal interest, this is one of those very powerful Eicha Psukim, etc. So, but why is this such a powerful Eicha Pasuk? Because we know the rabbi is pointing out to this parallel of Kelim, of golden vessels, of using lots and lots of vessels. They associate it with the temple, a space full of vessels of Kelim, specifically golden vessels. And they say, what vessels were they drinking, about, uh, drinking out of? Why did the author of the Megillah think it was important to tell us they were drinking out of vessels? They were drinking out of the vessels from the temple, says the rabbis, and we'll see that inside. But we see that this focus on the vessels, on the kilim, is so clearly textually and thematically tied to the temple, to the mikdash, to the, the building characterized by its kilim, characterized by its vessels, that the rabbinic interpretation ties it to it as well. Because we see in our description of Ahasuerus, of the time he period he lives in, of the kingdom he runs, of the party he throws, we see a clear parallel to the Mishkan, to the Mikdash, to Jerusalem. Now, finally, just one last example of this, a little bit more of a conceptual one. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Lutag points out a little bit of a clever one here, that um, if you look, the king threw his party for 180 days, right, for six months. So it says, where does it say this? Uh, so seven days here. Uh, okay, I'm missing the exact pasuk, but he throws a party for 180 days. Oh, here it is. Okay. So um, he wants to show the splendor of his kingdom here in verse four um, by the bolded words. Uh, many, many days he threw a party for 180 days. And he kicked it off with a seven day party, a special party. So, points, uh, Rav Liebtag points out that when we look at the Midrash, the Midrash actually situates the construction of the Mishkan in the desert as being a six month project, starting on Yom Kippur, extending all the way to Nisan, Tishrei through Nisan, and then kicking off with seven days of Milowim, seven days of inauguration. So we also have a parallel that Ahasuerus threw a six month party, kicking off with a one week uh, festival that closed it all down. So too, the temple was open, was constructed over a six month party, kicking off with a seven day festival. So that's a little bit of a more abstract one, but the clearer ones are really brought down in the Gemara Megillah. The Gemara Megillah here in source 10 says very clearly, all of these very clear textual and thematic parallels are brought in the Pesachim. So we'll see together inside, just go through them quickly. First, we see the Gemara Megillah here in 12, uh, 12a says, Baharot and Osher Kvon Machuto, quotes the Pasuk, the verse about showing off the glory, the glory and the riches of the kingdom. Rabbi Yossi Barchanina said, Melamed Shalabash Big Day Kehuna. We learn that Ahasuerus wore the Big Day Kehuna. Now, of course, this seems like such a random, such a ridiculous thing. Why would it be that he wore the big dekahuna? It says here, yakar and tiferet. And it says by the clothing that the high priest wore, that it was worn for majesty and for glory. So do the rabbis literally think Ahasuerosh wore the high priest garments? Maybe, maybe not. But what we see clearly is that Chazal are picking up on the textual parallels, the textual nuance here. We see the words Yakar and Tiferet here. We see Kavod and Tiferet there, very similar ideas. They're comparing them that we have a reversal, that the great leader is not the high priest in his beautiful clothing in the temple. It's Ahasuerosh and it's he in his hedonistic robes of beautiful, expensive dyes in his palace throwing a party. Continuing, Vashkop Eklai Zahav Ekelim Ekelim Shonim. So it quotes the verse of the golden vessels and the many vessels found in the palace. Me so why do we need this? So it says that a bakol, a, a voice went out and it said, 
uh, the early ones, referring to Belshazzar, the earlier Persian king, were destroyed because they um, used these holy vessels and you'll use them. In other words, says the rabbis, well, what vessels were they using? They were using the holy vessels that Belshazzar, the previous Persian king, had also used and been punished for using and vulgarizing. So again, we see this idea that they're talking about this, uh, that again, they're talking about this idea that we're tying it specifically to the temple. We're tying the scene, this party, the setting that sets the stage for the story that follows to the temple. And just one more example to drive this all home. We have one more uh, strange verse um, where the where the Pasuk says, the verse says, the yayin machut, rav ma'amit shakol echad echad hishkiu yayin, Okay, fine here. So skipping one, two, three, four, five, five lines from the bottom towards the end of the line here. Oh, let me get my little fuzzy dot and the annotate. I love that little fuzzy dot. It makes it easier for people to follow me. Here we go. Now everyone sees that little red fuzzy dot. Yeah, we get a good, get an affirmative. Okay, good. So we see, the Gemara quotes a strange verse. The, the, the verse says that the drinking at this party that Achashverosh threw was kedat enones. It was according to one's will, not forced. So my kedat, what's that mean one was able to drink wine at will? I'm a Rabbi Hanan, Rabbi Hanan said, Mishim Rabbi Meir, and then Rabbi Meir. Kedat shall Torah, like the religion of the Torah. Ma'adat shall Torah achilam and Ruba Just like in temple service, when we offer sacrifices to God, we offer a lot of animal, but only pour a little bit of wine as a libation. Af sudato shall oto rasha, so too, the meal of that wicked person, Achashverosh, his meal had much more eating than drinking. In other words, in a bizarre connection, they take the word dot, which means will, interpret it to mean dot like religion, say it means the Jewish religion, tie it to the sacrificial rite, and say, oh, clearly this means that they model the eating and drinking at Achashverosh's party after the way we offer food and drink to God on the altar and sacrifices. That just like we offer a lot, a lot of physical, a lot, a lot of solids, but only a little bit of wine libations, people had lots and lots of meat and they only drank a lot, but they didn't have nearly as much wine. So again, it seems like such a random connection, but what we have here is an attempt to tie the text, tie the texts together to make a thematic point, a thematic connection between the temple and the setting of Achashverosh. So what we're left with until now is a few expressions of this idea that we have a reversal, an unexpected, perhaps even ironic story, where what was previously held throughout Tanakh, throughout our religion, throughout our theology as Habira, as our focal point, as our spiritual focal point, Jerusalem, now we have a total reversal. Now we have a different Bira, a different capital, and that's Shushan. And unlike the Bira in Jerusalem, this Shushan has a hedonist capital, and it's full of kalim also, but these kalim are used to drink wine and eat food, not to serve God. It's full of people partying for 180 days, but they're not partying to celebrate God as part of inaugurating a temple. They're partying to party. We have a total reversal where the temple of God is being instead translated as being flipped into this mundane setting of the people, the Jews living in, living in the Persian kingdom of the time. That's what the setting, the first two chapters, our introduction to the setting and characters leaves us with. But the question that still begs to be answered, still begs to be asked here, is if that's the setting, if that's what we're dealing with here, we're trying to describe some form of reversal, sometimes the type of flipping on the head of the temple ideal, of the idea of a mishkan and a mikdash of a sanctified space as seen earlier in the Torah and earlier in the Tanakh. Why is that being tied here? Why is that the context that is fit for this story? So to try and answer that, I think we have to look elsewhere and understand the time context, the time period in which we're situating what's going on here. And before I do that, I just want to take a moment to address perhaps the elephant in the room, perhaps something that isn't troubling anybody. But uh, there's a big question surrounding the historical time period of Megillah Esther. Yes. So, great. So jo Joel knows this. There, there's a big question. And basically, the problem is that in the Gemara, the rabbis try to give their history of when the Gilad Esther was, of basically all of the Persian kingdom. And their history is based in the biblical account. And the biblical account and the rabbinic defense of the biblical account just leaves out a lot of kings. There, there are just a lot more Persian kings. I think I've talked about this once before in a different context, but like the, the like Tanakh, two of them, they might've mentioned like four or five, and there's like 
15 or like 12 different kings that reigned during that time period. So then you get to the, the Talmud, you get to the Gemara, and you have statements like, oh, Xerxes was added Xerxes, who was Ahasuerus, and those three kings are all the same king with different names. Because, you know, the historical record has 15 kings. The Ketuvim has five kings. And the rabbis try to collapse them all, and we end up totally wrong with a completely inaccurate history. I don't really care about any of that, though, because I think that is a question of science. That is a question of scientific fact, of historical dating. What day on the earth did this take place? I'm not so interested. What I am interested in is from the perspective of the tradition, from the perspective of the Nevi'im who wrote the books, from the Anche Knesset and Dola, the members of the assembly who canonized it, et cetera, in, 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 inherent in the tradition and from an insular perspective of the tradition, what time period, what context are we dealing with here? And I don't think that precludes, I don't think that's defeated by the historically accurate answer. I don't think anything we're gonna say is dependent upon believing in a historically inaccurate timeline of how things have played out. So just putting that actual historical question aside, which honestly, I'm not a Persian historian, so I don't even feel qualified to weigh in on. We're gonna look at from the, the traditional perspective within the sources, what context we're dealing with here. And given that, I think it's essential to understand that as we saw, Mordechai and Esther are situated as following immediately after Galat Bavel, immediately after the exile from Babylon, from Nebuchadnezzar. And this Gala, this period of exile is foretold in Yirmiyahu, in one of the prophets that precedes the exile, that precedes the story of Esther that takes place in exile. Rabbi, before or after Daniel? Oh, so I'm not actually so, so uh, holding, uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm not great with dates. So I'm not positive. I, I would assume also after Daniel. And oh no, of course. I, that's what makes sense. No, of course, it has to be after. Yeah, no, it's also after Daniel. That, that, that's I have a question. Yeah, no, it's after Daniel. Sorry, yeah, as well. Because this this is taking place after the Babylonian exile, and Daniel is during the the Nebuchadnezzar sure. during the Babylonian siege, etc. Sorry about that. Okay. So, so actually, as an interesting aside, um, when one of the sets of the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., that were found contained a pretty thorough account of the Tanakh, except for Megillah Esther because Esther is presumably the latest event to take place in the entire Bible. It takes place after Daniel, takes place after the exile. So we're dealing with the only book that takes place after the exile at the very end, towards the end of the historical canonized record. Great, thank you for the question. That, that's a good point though. But okay, great. So now, now I just wanna to look together a little bit at the Nebuah, at this prophecy of Yirmiyahu that deals with this period of exile that the Megillah opens up by situating us in. So Yirmiyahu tells us, Chomar Hashem, Thus says God, So when Babylon 70 years are over, I'll take note of you. And I will fulfill with you my promise of favor to bring you back to this place. For I am mindful of the plans I've made concerning you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a hopeful future. You'll pray out to me, I'll hear you. You'll seek for me and find, uh, so you'll search for me and find me. Because you search for me with all your heart. I will be at hand for you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes. I will gather you from the nations and from all the places to which I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I have exiled you. So God, via the prophet Jeremiah, describes a period of exile that fo follows Babylon. And that period of exile following the rule of Babylon, following Nebuchadnezzar, will one, be 70 years long, and two, including the 70 years, the, the way it will be characterized, after 70 years, we will pray and seek out God. We will be his paleo, we'll pray to God. We'll be kashtem, we'll seek him. Umetzata, and we'll find him, why? Ki tidrashenu v'chol because we sought him so hard. So there'll be 70 years of silence of, of God exiling us. Then we'll be so moved to find God that God will return us. That's the prophecy of the Babylonian exile. 70 years of exile followed by a Jewish revival. And in fact, well, 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 so given that prophecy, where in the 70 year period are we dealing in our Megillah story? What period are we dealing with? Well, we're certainly dealing with the period well after Nebuchadnezzar. We know that's just un unquestionable. We're dealing with after the first Babylonian rule. We're now under Persian rule, we're under Ahasuerus. 
But in fact, we're dealing with a rule that is somewhere between 70 to 170, depending on the historical record, but surely at least 70, if not many, many more years after the exile of Yirmiyahu. And from the rabbinic account, from the insular account of the tradition, it seems that we're about almost exactly 70 years from Yirmiyahu. Given that, we see that the Gemara, the rabbis in the Gemara, say that why was Achashverosh throwing a party in the first place? What was up with this huge celebration? Achashverosh's party was celebrating that the 70 years had come up and the Jewish people weren't returned. His kingship, his rulership of the Jewish people wouldn't be challenged. The previous king, Belshazzar, he miscalculated the 70 years. That's why he was killed. He thought he ruled the Jewish people. He invaded the temple. God got angry and punished him. But this king, Achashverosh got his calculation right. It's been 70 years. The Jewish people aren't going to be returned. So that's the context in which the rabbis and the tradition view this story as taking place. That this story is taking place in the context of just following up on the 70 years of exile of Yirmiyahu. And I actually think that Rav Liebtag also points out that subtly, we, again, when we look at the numerology, when we look at the dates, we see this reflected one more time in the dates and the details that often get overlooked in the Tanakh. Because for example, we see that when Haman makes his first decree, I was afraid someone was gonna start booing the first time I said Haman in the share. When Haman makes his first decree uh, against the Jewish people, when does he make his decree? The scribes of the king decreed on the first month, on the 13th day of the first month. First, the uh, 13th day of the first month, the first month, of course, we know is not counting from Tishrei, like we count, but from Nisan. So 13th of Nisan, 13th of the first month. And when exactly is the decree repealed? The decree is repealed, later on in chapter 8, we have the Sofrehemach, the scribes return, in the third month, on the 23rd day. So on the 13th day of Nisan, Haman decrees that the Jewish people will be killed in a couple, and you know, that come next year, come Adar. Then a few days later, Esther throws a party. A few days later, she throws a second party. About a week later in Nisan, let's say 20, somewhere between the 20th to 30th of Nisan, Haman is exposed and killed and hanged. And then like 50 days later, they repeal Haman's decree. So I guess all of us waiting for our, uh, for our stimulus checks know that bureaucracy could take a long time. Maybe it takes a long time to, you know, get uh, enact a policy. And maybe that's what's going on here. But Rabbi Liebtag points out that we have a beautiful point in the number and numerology in the days here. Because the fact that it took so long to repeal the decree means that Haman's evil decree lasted for 70 days. So if we're dealing with the period that caps off the 70 years of exile, and this is supposed to be the turning point in which the 70 years of Jeremiah's exile comes to an end, then we have Haman embody the 70 years of exile through a 70-day period of terror being wiped out. And that 70-day 70 70 period of, of terror was connected, was parallel to the 70 years of exile, and was a transitionary phase to the next stage. So again, though, we see this nice parallel, 70 days of the decree to the 70 years of exile that the Jews were waiting, which I think is just another beautiful idea, another beautiful parallel that sort of ties and con situates the context of when and what exactly we're dealing with here. And could you also say that it's coincided with Pesach, Passover, yeah. when all the destruction, when we were supposed to all be thrown into the, the men were going to be thrown into the water and then an end, you know, if you're counting, if you're counting 50 days later after everything, then you're counting the Omer and it ends at the you, you know, Sivan, it ends at the Shavuot. That's interesting. I hear that. I hear that idea. Maybe the, it's not really the 70 days from the first decree to the final decree. Maybe it's more like seven weeks or so from when Haman's hanged until the end. And then we have, you know, our and, nice... And, and because you just said, you know, it makes sense that it would be 70 days to the 70 years that we we're in exile before the 70 years we didn't get the land rest. But, oh. but also we didn't get the land rest. Therefore, also, what, what, is, what is Shavuot? It's also a, it, besides getting the Torah, what have you, it's also a uh, harvest holiday. Yeah, I think, I think that's also like a really nice idea and a really beautiful idea, for sure. So I, I, th I, think, that's, I think that's a great idea. So, so but, but I think that also plays into part of the broader theme we're dealing with here, especially when you said the Jews not giving the land of rest. Because a lot of, I think, given this context, what have we seen so far? Let's take a step back before we uh, transition to the final stage of this year. What we've seen so far is that we have a deep tie textually, 
and thematically between the Megillat Esther and themes of Israel, Jerusalem, the temple, the, the Mikdash, tying Esther specifically to the temple, tying it to the Mikdash and situating in the context of the Jews rebuilding the temple. That's the thematic and textual parallel. Then historically, we see that within the tradition, within the canon, the historical context, the historical background, the political background we're being put in is after 70 years of Babylonian rule, now Persian rule, and of course, those who read Ezra know, and we can see later on in the sources will cover that under Persian rule, Cyrus the Great allowed the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. Ezra led some Jews back to Jerusalem already. In other words, what we're dealing with here is a period where the Jews should be experiencing, as Jeremiah described, prayer and seeking out God. This should be the period where now that the 70 years are up, the Jews turn to God and seek him out desperately and find him and return and go back to Israel. But instead, what are the Jews doing at the beginning of the story? They're partying in the palace, treating this physical hedonist palace like a temple. Instead of the Jews saying 70 years are up, it's time, Ahasuerus is saying 70 years are up. The Jews aren't even keeping account, but the king is. Ahasuerus realizes it's time to return and the Jews don't. And of course, we see this translated in the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. In the last stories, in the very end of Tanakh, the very end of the Bible, the Jews don't really heed the call of returning after the exile of Babylon. A small fraction of the Jews return. A vast majority of the Jews don't even return. So the context we're dealing with is the Jews are finally at the period in history where they can be excited about the prospect of returning. Cyrus has allowed them to return earlier, perhaps it depends on your chronology, is Cyrus later, fine. You can ask whether the Jews practically could have returned. Minimally, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years has come up. Achashverosh in the rabbinic literature sees it's come up. But the Jews aren't doing anything. They're not planning to return. There's no excitement. There's no move. There's no movement to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the spiritual movement that was lost. And that's why we have this flipping on its head. That's why we have this total reversal that the temple is now being transposed into this hedonist palace. Given that similar idea, I just want to point out one other interesting uh, point that comes up in Ezra in the academic literature. So like I said, given that Ezra gives us a little bit of context, Ezra gives us the context of the, those who, the Shirat Sion, those who return to Zion after the exile of Babylon. And under Ezra, of course, Ezra led a very, very small minority of the Jews back to Israel, while the vast majority of Jews stayed in Babel, stayed in Babylon to be ruled by foreign kingdoms and to donate money to Israel, as if that made a difference. Sounds familiar, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll take uh, one message or another from that, I guess. But um, in the story of Ezra, we have this fascinating account of how the Jews, how the Jewish movement to return to Israel to rebuild the temple flourished under different Persian kings. And in chapter four of Ezra, we hear the following account. Malchut Achashverosh, under the king of Achashverosh, it's Chilat Malchut, the beginning of his kingship, Kitbu Shitna al Yoshe Yehuda Yerushalayim. The people, the, the antagonists of the Jews, wrote up accusations against the Jews in Jerusalem and sent it to the king. Now, just switching to the English because, you know, make it a little bit easier. And in the time of Adaxerxes, the next king, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabia, and the rest of their colleagues wrote to King Adaxerxes of Persia a letter in Aramaic and translate in Aramaic. And this is the letter. So we see that there's a letter that's sent to Ahasuerosh by the antagonists of the Jewish people, but we don't know what it says. But thankfully, if we keep reading, we get a sample of a letter that's sent to the next king by the antagonists of the Jewish people. And there we do see what it says. And what's that letter say? Rachum the commissioner and Shimshai the scribe wrote a, wrote a letter concerning Jerusalem to the king out as follows. Then Rachum the commissioner and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their colleagues, the judges, officials, officers, and overseers, the men of Erech and Babylon and Susa and the Elamites and the other people whom the great and glorious Asnapper deported and settled in the city of Samaria. First of all, I just want to point out, this should sound very familiar to the writing of Megillah to us. We have long lists of bureaucrats, names we've never heard of before, the need to praise officials, situate things with their scribes and which king is ruling. So we have something very similar, I think, to the writing of Megillah. And this is the text of the letter they send them, verse 11. To King Adaxerxes, your servant, men of the province beyond the river, and now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have reached Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. 
They are completing the walls and repairing the foundation. Now it be known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and the walls completed, they will not pay tribute, poll tax, or land tax. In the end, it will harm the kingdom. So we see in Ezra that during the time period of Ahasuerus, the opponents of the Jews sent a letter to Ahasuerus opposing the rebuilding in Jerusalem. And following that, the next king also, they sent a letter. And there we get a text of the letter. And what's the letter say? Don't let the Jews rebuild Jerusalem because they're bad citizens. They're not faithful, loyal citizens. If they rebuild Jerusalem, they'll all run away to Jerusalem and not support the kingdom anymore. So some academics claim, and I think it's a very interesting idea to point out, that perhaps Megillah Esther is, and this is not necessarily a claim on the historicity or truth of the events that took place that some academics may want it to be. Everything that took place could still be historically true and this still could be a fact of how it was written and how it was authored. But they claim that perhaps Megillah Esther is a parody of the letter that was written to Ahasuerus. That we see that at the time of Megillah Esther, at the time following the exile of Jeremiah, the Jews had a small, slow movement to rebuild in Jerusalem. And it was really dependent on the kings. Some kings allowed it, some kings slowed it down. And during Ahasuerus, during every single king, the antagonists of the Jews, the anti-Semites, would get their lobbying group and go to the king and say, the Jews are not trustworthy, don't let them build Jerusalem. For the other kings, we see the letters they write, but for some reason, for Ahasuerus, we don't see the letter. But the letter we do see, written in the exact same form, using some of the same language, very parallel and similar to this letter, is Megillah Esther. But in Megillah Esther, are the Jews not to be trusted traitors who are trying to undermine the king? No, quite the opposite. The Jews save the king's life. The Jews oust Haman as a power hungry, not to be trusted advisor. The Jews become the queen of the kingship. So Megillah and Esther is a parody of this claim, is a response to this claim. You're gonna write letters, you're gonna write propaganda saying that the Jews won't pay taxes and that the Jews aren't trustworthy. We're gonna write letters, we're gonna write propaganda saying that the Jews are the king and that the Jews are the queen, that the prince is actually, his mother is Jewish that the advisor to the king is Mordechai the Jew, and that the Jews are the best citizens of all, of course you should let them go rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, they'll still stay faithful. So just interesting to think, once we now pinpoint the traditional, the contextual point, where are we dealing with, what are we dealing with, we now appreciate also a little bit more the Ezra context potentially. That again, not that this contradicts any of the historical events, not that this contradicts the content of the Megillah, but perhaps in terms of how and why the Megillah is presented the way it is as this satirical letter full of opposites, reversing expectations, perhaps we have a satirical response or a rejection of the antagonistic letters that were being written in the time of Ezra. So that's, I don't wanna to go too, out, too far off on, on that. That's just something food for thought that I'm just gonna put on the table. Uh, feel free afterwards to let me know if you agree, if you disagree, what you think about that. I'll just, I'll just add that the Megillah itself refers to itself as a letter, Egeret Hapuri. Beautiful, exactly. And it refers to itself as an, as an Egeret, as a letter. And this is clearly a letter. Also, the idea of the Parshagin and the Sofrim are also ideas of uh, letters or scribal um, technicalities of trade. And those words also appear in the Megillah that, and they appear in Ezra here. So we have these like very clear parallels of a letter being written. So it's something interesting to think about of what would that mean if Esther's also being written almost as like a satirical claim that Jews can be good citizens of their homeland while also being supporters of Israel and settling the land of Israel. So part of what we'll talk about in the Drusha this week also is how Megillah Esther is perhaps the most relevant and most familiar of all the questions and stories in Tanakh. So stay tuned for the Drusha this week. Rabbi, but, Rabbi you know, I have another, connect, I mean, maybe this is off the beaten path probably is, yeah, but sure. another connection when you said, you know, the king, the king, and he celebrated because he thought the 70 years were up and he, and, and he made it, but he miscalculated and created this party, which was evil. And so if you take it back further in the beginning, the people miscalculated when Moses was coming back to the, down the mountain and they created an, an event which created evil for us. I mean, I was just thinking about the two miscalculations, the party and what happened and how Esther came came to our rescue. And then if you go back to the Mount Sinai, the people were expecting, where's Moses, where's Moses? And Aaron is supposedly stalling, give me this, give me that. And this calf walks out of the, this fire and everybody is celebrating because they miscalculated the date as well. Beautiful, yeah. I, think I just see the events kind of connecting with each other. 
Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful idea and like a really interesting idea. When is it or why is it that there's a miscalculation? So I, th I think that's something really interesting. Um, just for the, the sake of time, uh, I'm gonna just wrap up a little bit now. So, but what we've seen so far is this parallel, this reversal that situates Jerusalem as being parallel to Shushan and sees Mordechai as being a reversal of the expectation of the Ishibudi, that sees Ahasuerus as a reversal of Jewish leadership, and then ultimately sees the Jews as failing to rise to the moment and to return to Israel and rebuild the, the Jewish capital of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple because of their investment in Shushan, because of their investment in the politics of the era, etc. So now, just to save time, I'll skip over it, but I brought a couple of the sources from Divrei Yamim and from Ezra that just explicate that this was a well-known problem. Very few of the Jews made Aliyah under Koresh, under Cyrus. Most of the Jews stayed comfortable in their Babylonian homes. So, I mean, a familiar, a familiar problem, but not something that's so unexpected. But all that takes us to understanding, perhaps, to, to just going all the way back to source number two, to our Gemara, all of this might help us understand Marjoror. Helps us understand Mordechai. It gives us context and understand why is Mordechai tied to the temple? Because we're tying the whole scene to the temple, because we're doing a reversal of the spiritual message of returning to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple with the hedonism of now. But what about the name Esther? What are the rabbis pointing to? Why is the Megillah focusing on this name of Esther, of uh, this verse here, Vanochi Hester Esther? So when we look at this verse, when we look at this Pasuk, it's a very unusual Pasuk to quote because it's not the nicest Pasuk, it's not the most positive Pasuk. So the verse says in Dvarim, Yomer Hashem, Moshe, God says to Moshe, in you're gonna you're gonna die, you're gonna rest with your forefathers, skipping ahead. I'm gonna get angry, etc. etc. Fine. The Nochi, so God tells Moshe, you're gonna die, you're not gonna enter Israel. The Jewish people will enter Israel, but one day I'm gonna get angry at the Jewish people and I'm gonna I'm, and they're, I'm gonna punish them, I'm gonna exile them. The Nochi and I. Haster astir panai b'yomahu. I will hide my face on that day. For all the bad and wicked they did. So this verse of God hiding his face is clearly a negative thing. God is saying that when the Jewish people are really, really bad, he's going to hide his face. He's going to hide from them as punishment. And what's the resolution? What happens? Learn this song the Shira of Ha'azinu, and place it in the mouth of the Jewish people, and that will be the resolution of this period of exile. And of course, as we know, when we look at the Shira of Ha'azinu that follows, the song of Ha'azinu that follows, the redemption, the events, the Jewish history that's described in Ha'azinu can be characterized not as a story of Jewish redemption, of happy Jewish redemption, of return to Jerusalem, of a return to a strong relationship with God, but rather the events of Ha'azinu Describe a Jewish people who sin unrepentantly and who are only saved because God's image is embarrassed on the global stage. So we see, for example, in Hazinu in verse 20, for the Lord will vindicate his people and take revenge against his, uh, take revenge for his servants when he sees that their might is gone and neither bond nor free is left. And he'll see where are their gods, the rock in whom they sought refuge. God will see that the people of the nation are saying, oh, where's their God now? Who ate the fat of their offering and drank their libations? Why do they bother sacrificing? See then that I am here. So because God will see that the nations of the world, seeing how bad off the Jewish people are, will disgrace God's name, will disgrace the name of the Jewish God, God's will, God Hashem will be forced to act and to save the Jewish people. But what we see, it's not a salvation that the Jewish people are spiritually uplifted that they're excited about the prospect of returning to Zion, returning to Zion, rebuilding the second temple. No, it's a small minority of people because the prophecy happened, because the time has come and because God out of embarrassment, okay, he has to do it. I think it's very telling that that is the Pasuk that the rabbis tie to the story of Esther. Esther is tied to this idea of Hester Punim, to this idea of hiding one's face because Esther is the story of the Jews sinning. It's a story of the Jews not rising to the moment of Ezra, not rising to the moment of returning to Jerusalem, and needing Haman as a kick, needing Haman as a push to unify, to identify as Jewish and not as Persian, to realize that they have a stake and they have investment in the Jewish homeland and the Jewish nation. So ultimately, what we see here is that Mordechai, 
represents to us and in the rabbinic literature, the reversal, the sin, the problem of viewing Shushan as the new Jerusalem. And Esther is the theological consequence of that, that God punishes the Jewish people. God hides his face and forces, necessitates the Esther story where God is hidden and a decree as evil as Haman's can be made. So given that, we now can understand a little better our broader context. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a story that takes place in exile when the Jewish people are given the opportunity to return and they don't take it. God, frustrated and disappointed, sends a kick in the pan, sends Haman to give 70 days of terror, 70 days of impending doom, connected the 70 years of exile. We should have been doing tshuva. We should have been repenting. And ultimately what happens? Kimu Kiblu, the Jews reaccept their commitment to Torah, to Judaism, and it leads to a rebuilding and a reestablishment of the second temple. So now we can understand the historical context. We can understand some of the mixed somber notes and happy notes in the Megillah, and we can get a little bit better at what's going on broadly in the Megillah. So I hope this gave everybody a little bit of an understanding, a little bit of clarity. Tomorrow night, my tefillah share will also be Purim themed. It may or may not be tefillah. I, I'm not sure yet. I haven't decided. But it will be more halachic in uh, nature. This is more Tanakh, more Tanakh oriented. So stay tuned for that. And uh, for those who are interested, in 15 minutes, I'm going to be trying out a clubhouse share for the first time. So those on the clubhouse app, check me out at Liad Stoller. But I uh, thank you everybody for coming and learning with me tonight. And as always, feel free to call, text, or email me any thoughts you have. Have a good night. Hopefully I'll see people tomorrow. Or if not, hopefully I'll see you before Purim. But if not, Purim Sameach, Freelich and Purim to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Of course. Have a good night, everybody.